Hello, welcome to my review of Random Acts of Senseless Violence by Jack Womack, an epistolary dystopian novel released in 1993, sometime before dystopia became a genre that was ruined by 12-year-old girls. The novel is about 12-year-old Lola Hart and her family who live in a not-too-distant future in New York City as the United States begins to collapse. The plot description is about to begin, and this is your YouTube mandated reminder that the slider below or the chapters in the description below that will help you skip this section, but as usual, no part of this review should be considered spoiler free. At the beginning of the book, Lola's family are very much an example of modernity. Her father is a writer for TV shows and movies that are optioned, but never made. He's well paid for this pointless exercise, but he possesses nothing useful to any society that might survive after the one outside his window dies. Lola's mother was a teacher, but finds herself between jobs, and there are precious few of those even in that sought after profession. She finds odd jobs editing manuscripts for a publisher, but this is a trickle of cash and is not enough once Los Angeles is engulfed in violence and the script money disappears. This leaves the family in a quandary as both Lola and her sister, nicknamed Boob, attend a prestigious private school. The book starts with Lola receiving her diary for her birthday, along with a number of other gifts she soon laments when the family's money dries up, and a story is related entirely in a string of diary entries. Lola's friends at school are in a difficult situation as well. Laurie is soon sent to the ranch, which in this future is surrounded by rumours but known for sure to be a lot worse than Dr. Phil's, while Catherine is likely dealing with abuse at home. Sometimes later, the Hart family downsizes to cheaper property in a far less salubrious neighbourhood, with Lola never quite realising how close she came to being raped on her very first day there. She is saved by the intervention of Iz, a local girl who becomes a friend, and she soon falls in with Jude and Wheezy, members of the local gang who spend their time thieving and, in one case, prostituting to pay their way. In her new circumstances with Laurie away and with rumours circulating about her sexuality, Lola is soon shunned by her peers and her work at school deteriorates. Life at home is little better. Her father has a new job in a bookshop whose owner's unreasonable demands and psychotic behaviour makes his life a misery. Her mum, always a little flaky, has become dependent on mood stabilisers and little boob has withdrawn completely and eventually leaves the family to stay with an aunt in Los Angeles. Nothing seems likely to improve, and after her father is found dead through stress or overwork, they actually get considerably worse. Her mother stops working, and only her gang's charity is keeping the debt collectors away. After they're caught up in one of the city's many riots, Lola sets out after the bookshop owner and violent revenge. Despite what I said at the beginning, I don't actually blame 12 year old girls for the destruction of the dystopia as a place of thoughtful and intelligent science fiction. It is hardly their fault that publishers and schools saw one being a hit and served up nothing else for the next 10 years. But 1993 was a long time before the Hunger Games and this is a very different sort of dystopia to more modern fare. This is a very real, very near future where America's major cities are permanently engulfed in the sort of mostly peaceful protests that leave them under a permanent pall of smoke, where presidents die in pairs and nobody really notices the rich are too busy clinging to increasingly fragile privileges and the poor are too busy scraping together just enough to survive. Such is her upbringing that Lola generally has no idea what the protests are about. It all adds to a depiction of a brutal and convincing world accelerating to its own destruction with nobody able to apply any kind of break. The speed of the collapse in her circumstances mirrors the collapse of the country. Her descent from educated, thoughtful and precocious young girl to street thug happens very rapidly, but for the most part feels convincing, especially at that kind of impressionable age where young people are still really developing their personalities, still waiting to see where they fit into the world and where its boundaries are. In this world, Lola discovers there are actually very few, only really where somebody has already made a claim and has the strength to hold it. The local gangs operate freely enough and stay absent from the protesting because they're the only ones with something to gain from the status quo. The bookshop owner, Mr. Mossbacker, is a genuine villain when compared to her gentle and civilised father. And the ever-changing government is faceless and ineffective. Sending the military into urban environments only exacerbates an extremely tense situation. Lola's narrative relates the building tension as if it's a minor aside as she chews over her relationships with her friends and family and tries to live as normal a life as possible. 
Much of the early tension comes from the various family dramas always feeling more serious than they should, and the adults inevitably making the lives of the children worse. Right up until she's in the middle of a major riot, it always feels like Lola is a step detached from the situation. As a character, she's completely convincing, and her collapse into Feral Street Thug is mirrored in the text as she gradually adopts the identity and language of her gang. The young girl who writes like this at the start writes very differently towards the end. Daddy wanted to buy me a stuffy, but I'm too old for them now, I think. I'm 12. Mama says, that's not old at all, sweetie, not at all, but it is. I already have more stuffies than fit on my bed now anyway. Boob started crying because she wanted a stuffy, but Daddy said she didn't have a birthday, so why should she get one? Then he bought her one anyway, a little brown rabbit. Mama called Daddy a sucker. We lived right one time, Anne, and then it all popped. There's no knowing why there's not. What did I do to bring down this what? When I solo now, I feel constant set to blow like I could bloody everybody I see, unreasoned, I know, but that's that. I don't see how it's handleable, but everybody bypasses somehow. They say it's hard to think. I will. There's too much I hate now. What did I do, Anne? What did I do? This world is extraordinarily hard for a 12-year-old, and it's little surprise that she bends so much and then eventually succumbs to the pressure. Each situation her family faces seems believable, not that far from situations a great deal of us have faced, but like her family, we'd all rather people her age didn't have to face them alone. They all lead her from one problem to the next, slightly worse problem to the next. It's a great tragedy to witness. The world, the characters, the language, the situation are all brilliant and effectively related. The very final diary entry is probably the only one I found questionable, which is a shame, but also an indication of a text of the highest quality. In truth, the only criticism I could level at this book is actually intertextual, in that it's very similar to Anne Frank's diary. Both girls are similar in age, both get the diary in similar circumstances, are critical and brutally honest about those around them, both create an identity for their diary separate from themselves, and Lola's here is even called Anne. Is there something unseemly about taking influence from a text like that and profiting from it? I'm not sure. In conclusion, Random Acts of Senseless Violence is rather an overlooked entry to the science fiction canon, despite this SF Masterworks edition attempting to address that oversight. It is absolutely enthralling from the first page to the last, a grim dystopian hellhole that actually doesn't seem so far removed from our current reality, which takes a talented and kind young woman and utterly destroys her. It's not hard to be moved and hope against hope for a positive outcome, but this is the kind of dystopia that simply doesn't have them. It's a magnificent book, and I can't recommend it highly enough.